It's January, February, which means um, we're in Genesis. We've done that for uh, several years. And uh, you could go into this book on a pretty regular basis and come out surprised often. It's that dense, it's that complex, it's that interlinked and connected to other stories. Um, It's pretty fascinating stuff. And every year that we do this, there are some people who love it and some people who hate it. It's okay, we don't do it all the time. And uh, part of the reason they hate it is because I have to make a big pile. Often, there is so much interlinking and interconnectedness that you have to kind of draw all of these lines and help people see the big picture before you make the point. And sometimes that takes a while. It takes a while to stack everything up in the middle and make a big pile and people are like, oh, what are we doing? This is excruciating. But we're going to get there because there's going to be value in it. Now, um, part of the problem that takes place when I do that, when I have to make a big pile, is that I have to move fast. I have to go past things that I can't stop and digest with you. And it can lead to unintended consequences. Like, for instance, last week, um, the first comment that I heard standing in the lookout hall after the service was somebody came up to me and said, Blair, you're going to have to do a lot of explaining for all of those parents who've named their kids Jacob. (laughs) Right? Because I believe I said in the service, Jacob, that's a horrible name. But it gets better. I then later on in the morning met somebody who was visiting Waypoint, and they said, our son is named Jacob. I guess we should have done more research. Honestly, never thought about that once. Can I hit a little pause button? When I'm talking about Jacob, I'm talking about the guy in this story, not a lump sum group of you. And this guy was given a name by his father that was intended to do harm to him. He was dealt a bad hand. Now the the thing is, just because he had a bad hand doesn't allow him to stand before God someday and say, my dad made me do it. No, he was still responsible. He had all of these insecurities that had kind of welled up in his heart with his brother. And so he, he was in a bad place. But here is what is true about his story. It's true about the story of God. You can look through the scriptures. This is consistent. On a regular basis, God chooses the underdog. Judah, Moses, David, every one of the disciples, a reject from the educational system, every one of them. God has this thing where he looks differently upon people. If you would look at this story, Esau would be the leader. He's a studly guy, manly man. He's the easy choice. His heart didn't care about the mission of God. But God looked at these two brothers and realized that there was something in the heart of Jacob that he could work with given enough time. And although Jacob starts on a pretty bad course and stays bent for a long time, he becomes a key player in the story of God which is good news for you and I, because in this country, when we name kids, we use one of two, these are the most popular methods that I've heard. One, I like the sound of the name, and people make up weird stuff because they like the sound of it. Or two, I know somebody, and so I name them after somebody. My first and middle name are both People that my parents knew, they got the names from somebody they knew. That's pretty common. So if your parents looked around and said, we like the name of Jacob because he seemed to be a major player in God's story, that's awesome. I mean, how many of you look into the Hebrew to figure out what the Hebrew name is for the meaning of the name before you give it? You're not Jewish. People don't do that. So if you've got the name Jacob... You're doing all right. And, it, and you're going to see in this story, that's where it heads. But that's not where we had to start because our story starts 
with a guy who is full of insecurity. He's compared himself to his brother. His parents compared himself to his brother. And everything he did as he walks in to deceive his father is something that the scriptures mention as a comparison between the two of them. And he is trying to cover up his inadequacies. Feels like a failure put against his brother. And he's hiding. And that's where we started. But God's going to move him today. And I want to tell you some about how that process took place. But we're going to start with a song that could have easily been written about the life of Jacob. It wasn't. But there are so many things. Just listen carefully to the song and you're going to hear his story. But it's possible that you also might hear yours. So I hope you'll um, pay close attention to this because this stuff about insecurities is as much about us as it is about Jacob. Check this out. Yeah, that was a pretty good job. Ever feel that way? Yeah. It's me. Hi. I'm the problem, and I know it. 
the insecurities that Jacob had made him the anti-hero in this story. And you know what was weird? God was the one who was rooting for him. But as you start the story, it's hard to root for a guy who just ripped off his brother, deceived his father, and dragged his mother into a scheme at a level that she didn't want. But that's what he did. Because his insecurities are driving his life. They own him in this moment. And, And it's running away with who he is, taking him to places he would never be, alienating him from most of the people in his life. Now, understand, his whole family is a train wreck. Esau is, not, Esau is not better. Dad has been playing favorites and has been unkind to him from birth. And mom, she's a manipulator. When we left the story last week, she told Jacob, you got to get out of here because of what you did, right? You went and deceived. We got to get you to Laban. But she didn't, have, she didn't have the authority to send him to her uncle, to his uncle, So what she does is she remembers something that was true earlier in the text and she goes and she says this to Isaac. She she repeats this. This is what was said earlier in the text. Genesis 26, 35. Says this about Esau's wives. They were a source of grief to Isaac and Rebekah. So she goes to Isaac and says, don't let Jacob marry the same kind of girls that drive us nuts. You need to send him away. So Isaac, who has the authority, sends him away. But that's not, that was not the reason why. She was manipulating this process. She knew that when Jacob left, that he was leaving because his brother was so angry he could kill him. And she was looking for some way to protect him. And instead of to be honest about that, she was manipulative But Jacob walks away from that whole family. He's isolated, he's by himself, he wanders off into the wilderness, and I'm wondering if he's thinking, it's me. Hi, I'm the problem, it's me. Like I did this to myself. I I caused this problem, this deception. By by the way, I, I was surprised to learn this. There's actually, um, there's actually a group of people who think that Jacob did nothing wrong. I was, I was watching um, a lecture by a Jewish rabbi in this very section of scripture when somebody in the audience started yelling at him about how he got it wrong. It, because God had promised that Jacob would be the leader. Jacob could do whatever he wanted, whatever he wanted to end up the leader, which means if he had to deceive his father, it was okay. There was nothing wrong with it. It was God ordained. And the guy's getting yelled at. And I was like, wow, that that does not look like a fun place to be right now. But that's because everybody doesn't agree about this. And I, I wonder if Jacob couldn't agree. Because here's the problem. When you say, I'm the problem, it's me. What that often means for you is that you're looking at that that insecurity. You're looking at that flaw, that inadequacy in your life, and you're calling that out and saying, if I didn't have this, I wouldn't be broken. If I didn't have this problem, I'd be okay. And it actually pulls you further into the insecurity So Jacob, he's got this big consequence that he's about to face. He's leaving home. The scriptures record that he takes a staff. That's it. That's going to cause real problems for him later. And the first thing that happens is he wanders out on his first night alone, isolated. He lays down, puts his head on a rock, and has a vision. 
This vision starts in Genesis 28, verse 10. It's a very famous story. Um, most of you guys would have heard it. He, he lays down and he has a vision of angels going up and down a ladder. And people call it Jacob's ladder. It's not Jacob's ladder. It's God's ladder. The angels are coming up and down to minister to those who are on the earth. And Jacob has this vision. Now it turns out that that little happening is really important. But you can't understand how significantly important it is until we create a pile and get to the end where there is something else in the story that's meant to be compared against it. So that's what we're going to do. I want you to bookmark that. He leaves. He has this vision. Um, and then he continue, continues on. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go fast which again, risks all kinds of things. I get that. But I want to put the pile on the table so that we can get to the place where something else happens that can be compared. And, and you'll understand it when we get there. He continues on after that night, gets to Laban's house and realizes pretty quickly that he's in love with Laban's youngest daughter, Rachel, and would like to marry her. But he came with a staff only. There's nothing that he can offer as a dowry. He's got nothing. So Laban takes advantage of him and says, if you'll work for me for seven years, you can marry my daughter, Rachel. He agrees. He's in that love. In fact, the scripture's kind of, it's kind of cool how the scripture writes this. It's like seven years had passed like it was nothing. Like, oh, so, like, oh, man. It's a scary romance novel right there. But here's what happens. On his wedding night, this is not, I can't even imagine this. It's dark. At the time of the night where Rachel would be brought to the betrothal tent, there was a special tent that was set up over these ceremonies. She would be brought to the tent and ushered in and Laban switches out daughters he has an older daughter. And so he takes Leah and he puts her in the tent. There's no, there's no lamp in there. You don't know what's going on. He finds out it's the wrong woman in the morning when there's enough light to see. But he's married now to the older sister. And he's furious. And he is so upset that this has happened to him. And he goes to Laban and he says, I entered into an agreement to marry Rachel and you slipped Leah into my tent. What's happening here? And Laban goes, listen, that's just not our custom. We don't let the, we don't let the older daughter get married last. Like he's just making stuff up. He's making stuff up. It wasn't a thing. And so he says, if you want to marry Rachel, just see the rest, the weddings took a week. Just see the rest of the week out. And at the end of the week, I'll let you marry Rachel. We'll do another week ceremony and you can have two wives at the end of this. But you have to agree to work for seven more years for me to do this to you. Now here's, here's what I think is happening. I think sometimes because it's difficult to look in the mirror and to when, when you see, I'm the problem, it's me, you see just the insecurity. You see that flaw. You see the inadequacy. And so sometimes something else has to happen in your life so you see it differently. And one of those things that I think God sometimes allow is right here. I think he allowed Jacob to experience what he had done to others. J Jacob had been deceptive to his brother. His brother was weeping crying for his dad to bless him. And his dad was like, I don't have a blessing to give you. Makes up a lame blessing and gives it to him one anyway. But his, his brother is distraught and so angry that he could kill somebody at this point. That's what Jacob did by his choices. And now all of a sudden, Jacob is faced with the same kind of thing. He's, he's kind of getting a chance to understand what that feels like. Do you feel any sorrow for this at all? Do you feel bad that this has taken place? Or are you still in the camp that thinks, you know what? 
it was either cheat or be cheated. I either had, I either had to do that or Esau was going to end up with a blessing. And he, and he still hadn't come to a place where he had any sense of regret. This is going to cost 14 years of his life. And yet, we don't know. There, there's no indication in the text that through those 14 years that he has any regret about what he's done. He's unhappy that he's been cheated. He doesn't like it. And, and sometimes I think this is exactly what, what happens with us. And you ought to pay attention to the circumstances you're in. If you own a security in your, insecurity in your life, if that's running you, God will let you see that you are out of sync some way. And one of the ways is he'll let you experience what you put other people through. He'll let you see it, feel it, hear it. But you got to be paying attention because I'm not sure Jacob is. Now what's interesting is the scripture points out that Laban realizes that he's being blessed because of the presence of Jacob. Jacob. And so he wants to keep him around. And so in chapter 30, verse 28, he says this to him. Name your wages, I will pay them. Wow, that's awesome. Write your ticket. And Jacob does. He comes up with a plan. The scriptures then go on to reveal that Laban changes the agreement between them 10 times to gain an advantage. He cheats him 10 different times. But don't worry, because from 29 through 30, what you're looking at is a master class in how to cheat the people in your lives. And Jacob and Laban are competing. It's like a championship. Somebody's going to come out on top. And they're both going at it. They're both going at it. Just so you understand how much time we're talking about here, he agrees to work for Rachel for seven years, ends up with Leah. Agrees to marry Rachel seven more years. Names his wages, and then they start fighting and bickering about that. Six more years. He's there 20 years. 20 years. Why is he there so long? Because sometimes the other thing that God does is he puts you in front of a human mirror. It's not just circumstances that you experience. I hear this all the time. I hear this from people all the time. I love them. I like them, but I can't work with them. They're too much like me, right? I've heard people say that about their kids. We, I love my kid, but we just can't be around each other very much. They're too much like me. And the solution in our culture is we need to stay away from each other. Like, we should separate. It's never gone off. Like, has the thought ever gone off in your mind that maybe I should change something if that, it's like if I'm that big of a pain in the butt to work with, maybe something should be altered. Like maybe I should do something different. He gives him a human mirror so that he can look ahead and go, if I keep going in the course of my life, that's what I'm going to end up like. That's the kind of man I'm going to be. You want to know the kind of man Laban was? His own daughters didn't respect him at all. Because when finally Jacob realizes after 20 years, after 20 years of experience being cheated, after 20 years of looking in a human mirror where he could get some real live feedback, he gets frustrated it's the first point in the story where he's willing to consider doing it a different way because up until this point, his motto has been cheat or be cheated. You want to cheat me? I'll out-cheat you. You want to mess with me? Fine. Let's go. I got you. And it was only after 20 years of frustration that he goes to God and God says this to him. This is chapter 31, verse 3. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Go back to the land of your fathers, to your relatives, and I will be with you. This is a change in the story. 
It's at this part of the story that he goes and he talks to the, his two wives and says, I don't know, I'm thinking about leaving. What do you think? And they're like, let's ditch this guy. Let's ditch Laban. We know he's our dad. We don't have any loyalty to him at all. We see what's going on here. There's only one problem. What's the problem? His mom had said, when your brother is so furious, or when his fury goes away, I'll send word for you. Did she ever send word for Jacob? We, we don't ever see that in the text. In fact, th- these are the unattended consequences of him making the choices that he made. He never saw his mother again. You want to know what's funny? He did all of that Like he sold and got the birthright, he got the blessing, he did all of that stuff to cheat it. Do you know he never got his birthright? He left with a staff and when the father died, the whole estate went to Esau. He didn't get a dime of it. So all of the scheming, all of the stuff that he was doing to get ahead, it never transpires. And all he's left with is 20 years of battling with an uncle until he gets to a place where God says, what I want from you is to go back and face your brother. And I had to leave a hole in his gut because he'd been staying there this whole time because he thought it was possible that his brother would kill him. What do I do? He makes a choice. He makes a choice to return home and to see his brother. And this is where we're trying to get to. In Genesis chapter 32, 1 and 2, he finally sets out. He leaves from Laban's house, and this is what's said. Jacob also went on his way, this is verse 1, and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, this is the camp of God. So he named that place Mahanaham. Now, um, what's interesting here is this is a second time where he's had an interaction with angels, but it is radically different from the first. And this is why, um, this is why you have to know some things about the book of Genesis. Some of you have been exposed to this, others have not, so I'm going to bring people up to speed as fast as I can so that we can move forward into it. There is a Jewish writing technique Um, used in the book of Genesis, it's actually used in other sections of scripture too in the Old Testament, called the chiasm. It was a special kind of writing tool where you would create pairs. Um, There would be, it's either ideas, words, phrases, all that kind of stuff, A and A, B and B, and they, they would be spread out throughout the scripture, leading to a centerpiece, E, And then on the edges, there's a little E, and the the writer was trying to make sure that you knew exactly what they wanted you to talk about and think about. But, I've learned this, um, the A and the A and the B and the B and the C and the C, those were also meant to be compared and contrasted with each other so that you could understand what the writer was trying to tell you was important even in those kind of things. Now what's fascinating about the story of Jacob is that the A and the A also have pairs. It's one of the most complex chiasms in the text. So the A and the A have a one, two, three, and a four, and a one, two, three, and and they're, they're blended, and you have to compare those against each other to know what's going on. That's the kind of stuff. You know how many pairs are in the story of Jacob? 84 84. So I'm saying you could dig around in here and come out surprised a lot because what they're trying to do is find a way to make sure that you're thinking about and looking at the stuff that the writer wants your attention focused on. And they use this writing technique to do this. I think it's so complex, the only writer that I think could pull it off is God. So when I tell you I think that God inspired the writing of these texts. I'm not joking around because I don't know how you can get this complex. It's that incredible. Well, it turns out that one of those like CC kind of comparisons is the two angel stories. 
They're, they're, they're parallel in the story of where they fall. And so I want to do what the writer of the text wants us to do, which is to compare these two things. And we're going to find that there's a dramatic difference that's happened in Jacob's life. And then we're supposed to ask, why? Why? Okay, so let's do this real quick. We're going to compare chapter 28 and 32. In chapter 28, he's running from his brother. In chapter 32, he's going towards his brother. Big difference. But he's still moving, he's traveling, and his brother's involved. The second, he has a dream about angels in 28. You can go to the next slide. And in the other slide, or in the the other uh, chapter 32, it's actually real angels. It's almost like the writer is trying to help you understand that Jacob was so out of sync with God that the best he could muster was a vision But now he's so in sync with God, they're on the same plane with him, they're interacting with him, they're supporting what he's doing. It's vastly different. Angels, yes. The interaction with them, very different. There's a ladder the angels are coming up and down on. So the angels are, and I'm going to leave a hole here, but I want to point this out. Just so you understand how complex this scripture is. In the story of Jacob and the ladder, where all of these things are happening right here, there are five or six different links to the story of Babel. Same phrasing, same words, same kind of stuff. They do that so that you'll refer both stories to each other and you'll ask, why are these stories related? And this one's kind of easy. In the story of Babel, people were trying to build something to God so that they could build a name for themselves. What did Jacob just get done doing after he was having this dream? He just ripped off his brother in an attempt to build a name for himself. And the scriptures want you to know that he was at that point carrying the spirit of Babel. It was about him building his own name. Now I'm going to leave a hole here for a reason. We're going to come back to that. In in 28, he's an observer. That's the best that he does. He just observes these angels going up and down. He's a participant now. He's a participant in the story of God. There's more. You can you go to the next slide real quick? I think I know what it is. Okay. The scripture says he went out to a certain place. He doesn't even know where he's at. He's lost. It's not. He names the place afterwards. But in, it's up to that point. He doesn't have any idea. But on, on 32... He's on his way. He knows exactly where he is. He knows exactly where he's going, and he has a purpose. No purpose before, now he has a purpose. And then it gets interesting because he names both places. That happens in both texts too. In 28, he names it Bethel, the house of God, which you would think is a pretty cool name. I'm just talking about this Bethel, okay? So let's not make a global Bethel comment here. Why is that a problem? Because Jacob's in the middle of nowhere. He doesn't know where it is. He's lost. It's a certain place. That's the best he could do. And he says, this is the house of God. And he's about to leave there. Does God go with him? Or does God stay in his house? And Jacob's mind... He was separated from this God, and he happened to stumble across this place where God might be. But in chapter 32, he, oh, go back. Go back one slide if you could. In chapter 32, he says, all right, um, camps. It's two camps. What's the difference between a camp and a house? camp can get tore down and moved, right? And you you see on the screen why that's important. In chapter 32, he is going back to his brother and he is so afraid that his brother is going to kill them, he breaks his family into two groups. And look what he says. He's talking to God when he says this in verse 10. I'm unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only a staff when I crossed the Jordan But now I have become two 
camps. Where's God with two camps? In Jacob's mind, God's now traveling with him. And when Jacob can't even be there, he's there with his family. Do you understand the shift in perspective that's going on here? He, he sees God very differently than early on in the text. What, what happened to get him there? Well, there's more. I, I want to take you back to the hole real quick. Can we go back to the hole? Because there's a chiasm here, and he wants you to see that there's something missing. And in verse 32, there's no ladder, or is there? What is the ladder in chapter 32? It's Jacob. Jacob's the ladder. Jacob has become the instrument by which God is now bringing his values back to earth. He was using angels to do it before because Jacob was so disconnected from anything that was going on that he wasn't part of the story. But now he is a part of the story. I'm going back to heal this thing with my family. I'm going back to face all of the stuff that I did. I'm going to take responsibility. And when I do that, I'm going to actually represent God in the way that God wanted our family to be a representative of his on earth. He wants us to bring his values to, and this is the first time he's starting to be the kind of leader that he was asked to be. And how did it get that way? After 20 years of thinking, hi, I'm the problem, it's me, he was able to look at something else and it changed everything. Did you pick up what it was? For the first time in Jacob's life, he's become a follower. A follower. He's been a follower of himself this whole time, but now he's become a follower of God. And you wanna know, this is just the flat out truth. If you've got an insecurity in your heart that owns you, that directs and shapes the path that you're taking, because every time you think, I'm the problem, it's me, and you look in the mirror, you see that flaw, you see that inadequacy, you think, I'm not enough, I'm not good enough for this, you focus on that, and it leads you, causes you to make decisions. But when you choose to follow someone who's bigger than that, your inadequacies become dwarfed. Jacob's sense of inadequacy is not going to go away. I can show it to you in other parts of the story. He's going to continue to have some errors, but for the first time in his life, following has changed how he feels about that. And he's finally become the kind of person who's on mission for God. Listen carefully. The opportunity exists for you to do the same thing. Because in spite of the insecurities that you might walk around with, God is going to bring opportunities in front of you where you can act in a way that shows love and kindness to a world that needs God's kingdom brought to earth. And he always meant for you to be a part of that. And the choice is, will I follow and dwarf the insecurity? Will I I place my security with something that's bigger than the way I feel? Or will I let this keep shaping my path? And we're seeing in the life of Jacob this kind of breakthrough moment where he's become so frustrated by getting led around by his own insecurities that he chooses God. And when he chooses God, God gives him a task and then he has to step into it. My friends, that is how it's going to play out in your life. God will bring into your heart and mind acts of love and kindness that you could do to people around you to some people that you don't think deserve it. And that will be the request 
to see if you're willing to partner, to see if you're willing to consider that I don't care if I'm inadequate or not, I'm willing to follow above all else and it will reshape your story. Too many times, we get stuck looking in the mirror at our flaws and insecurities and we say, I'll move finally when these go away. They go away when you put your security and trust in something bigger than those. The call is for you to follow. The call is for you to incline your heart towards God. And to go with him on a ride. God chooses the underdogs. And if you think your insecurity has kept you out of the game, you're not right. You have. But God's looking. He's cheering for the anti-hero. He wants you in the game. And he's just waiting for you to trust him more than you trust your own insecurity. Can I pray with you? God, Jacob has these insecurities for a good reason. His parents named him, his parents treated him poorly. The scriptures say just as boldly as they can that his dad loved his brother more than he did Jacob. And so he, he had a weight on his shoulders. God, I, um, I've had enough conversations with people to know that those kind of weights are walking around with people right now today. They've, they've got this thing where they don't feel like they're enough. And they thought, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conquer this by, I'm going to stare this thing down in the mirror, but the more they look at it, the more it seems to own them, the more it seems to take control of their life. And God, this morning I ask that you would offer them some freedom. I ask that you would speak into their hearts an act of kindness, an act of love, a task where if they would just trust you, they could be the latter. They could start bringing your values to earth. That if they would put their security in you above all else, it would dwarf this other thing that's sitting in this life, telling them lies. God, that's how important your presence in our hearts is. And when Jacob finally had some clarity to know it's you I trust, it's you I follow. It started to change his world. God, I ask that our worlds will be shifted and changed this morning. That the Spirit would be active throughout this whole congregation, just speaking little roles that they could play right now to partner with you acts of kindness, acts of love. God, as they hear that, I ask that they would have the courage to follow, not to excuse because of all of their failings, but to just follow you. May you dwarf these things in our lives, become bigger than life for us, and change the direction of our hearts. I believe this is what you want to do. I believe this is the kind of God you are. You've been doing this for thousands of years and you want to continue to do that right here, right now. Speak to us. We have hearts open to listen. In Jesus' name, amen.